All right, welcome to another episode of Nostalgia Street, where we share the stories that shape us. That's a lot of SHs. I, I almost messed that up there. Uh, I'm joined, as usual, by my business partner, Vince. And today, our special guest, uh, he's he, a big guy, so I can't, I gotta be nice. <laughs> His name is Nathan, we'll leave it at that. And as usual, uh, we're gonna start this off uh, with an uh, interesting question of the week from Vince. So in our pre-show, we heard from our guest that he really, really dislikes the music genre of country. So, of course, we're going to pick on, pick on him for that. <laughs> now, in 2024, we've had lots of artists that have done crossovers, like Beyonce just dropped a country album. So, Nathan, which of your artists that you enjoy would you tolerate a country album from? And how would that go? Like, what would be the title of their first song? <laughs> the title of their first song. Wow, that's really hard. I'm not sure I said I disliked country. It just wouldn't be my favorite genre, that's for sure. And I get plenty of opportunities in Sioux Falls to see it. So, um, <laughs> wow. You know, I, I'm, I'm that 80s guy. Uh, I was not an 80s hair guy. I was more uh, the alternative rock scene, which could have had some albums that went a little further down that road, a little closer to country, but uh, actually had a story that made sense other than a pickup truck and a beer so um <laughs> is, is that the title of the first song a pickup truck and a beer <laughs> so, yeah something about their mother a yeah. beer <laughs> something about their mother yeah. <laughs> nostalgia street invites you on a retro ride that's more than just a trip down memory lane uncover life lessons and personal growth stories that stem from our collective past so you can live a richer more connected life today whether you're a 90s kid an 80s teen or simply young at heart you'll find something to relate to in each episode now let's get into today's episode and drive down the nostalgia street all right well our guest today is nathan stalinga nathan is the executive director for dakota abilities and we'll certainly be talking about that topic a little bit later on but nathan when you were a young child Back in the day, was it Nathan or Nate, or what did you go by? You know, around the neighborhood, it's probably Nate. Uh, certainly my sisters. I have a couple older sisters, so it was Nate. That's about the only people who call me Nate anymore, a couple close friends and, and sisters. Um, you know, I grew up a hilltop kid in Sioux Falls, uh, so lots of time around the neighborhood just running around and, and uh, trying to stay out of trouble. Wreaking havoc. So for yeah. the uninitiated, what is the hilltop of Sioux Falls? So hilltop would be kind of like the Cleveland uh, area, Cleveland Elementary, St. Lambert's is in that area gotcha. uh, where Austed's golf is now. Sure. It's kind of a boundary. You know, I've been involved in a lot of different groups in Sioux Falls that looked at the, the future of, of town, and, and people always talk about the North Enders. And in those groups, I'll say, well, I was a Hilltop kid. And I think that's one thing as Sioux Falls grows, you're starting to see some distinct areas where we are still all one city, but there are parts of it where you go, I, I mean, I. My entire life here, uh, I've lived on the east side of Sioux Falls. You know, it's uh, that west side is something different, and uh, <laughs> doesn't mean it's bad. It's just, just, just different. different. Yeah. So, did your hilltop gang? Did you guys have any gang signs or anything like that? Oh, we, oh, we bad. We east side. East side. <laughs> east side. <laughs> he did that fast. <laughs> They meet every Tuesday for bridge. <laughs> yeah, for bridge. Lots of practice. Good Lord. Now, I grew up in a neighborhood that had probably nine or ten guys around a year or two of each other. And so you were constantly doing something. You know, Sandlot, the movie, could have been made about our neighborhood. Nice. I mean, it was riding to the pool. I don't remember anyone getting a kiss from a lifeguard. But uh, <laughs> we certainly were at that pool daily and uh, playing different sports all summer until or night games until it was time to go home so was there a, a haunted house in the neighborhood or a scary neighbor like old man foster something that you just had to be wary of oh, old man foster i think every neighborhood <laughs> has that person that just as a kid you're just going I, I, it's just not approachable yeah. or that was the house that got ding dong ditched the most <laughs> <laughs> did you mind your house <laughs> yeah <laughs> Old Man Foster, who who was on the show that had that? Oh, Joe Bachelor, <laughs> in his neighborhood. He's on. The, he's like on the more on the south side, I think. And some uh, the guy's place that you didn't approach. His name was Old Man Foster. <laughs> so we just bring it up <laughs> just, all the time. It sounds like somebody be in a movie for sure. Okay, so I'm, I'm surprised that Vince hasn't asked this yet. I hate to step on his toes, no, do it, do it. but I got to ask it. So, uh, what did you do that got you in the most amount of trouble growing up? 
you know, I, I think, again, as a neighborhood, you're protective. And, uh, but you're stuck by your buddies. So yeah. if when you went to the pool, there was always the, the next neighborhood over. And, you know, we didn't do a lot to get in trouble. I, I, I'm a, I was a pretty good kid. Uh, I do remember the day before junior high started, because it was still junior high back then, not middle school. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm get, I have a twin brother. And I'm, I'm riding on the seat, and he's pedaling the bike, and we were told we were never supposed to do that. And so two houses before we get home, I jump off the back of the bike, not realizing motion continues to go. <laughs> uh, separate a shoulder and uh, was busted. Oof. <laughs> Oof. That, that, was, that was a tough one. But, uh, you know, there were some antics that certainly happened, and, and uh, any kind of... Uh, time of getting in trouble or long past but uh now it was more of those just those har kind of harmless neighborhood things where like i said ding dong ditch or <laughs> those sorts of things did you ever put the poop in a bag light it and run away we did not do that you know if we go <laughs> later in 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 time where i went to college there were common bathrooms and we went and took the toilet seats off every other floor's <laughs> toilet yeah. so that they wouldn't be able to use it in that way <laughs> um, gotta use the hover technique that's <laughs> amazing <laughs> that's pretty good where would you put the toilet seats uh, i think they went out into the the trees behind the building <laughs> they played horseshoes of them yeah exactly <laughs> they made the freshmen stand still we're gonna put this over your head son <laughs> stand here and hold this yeah. <laughs> so we how should have rented them we should have like charged money to be able. <laughs> Do you have nicknames in your group of friends? I actually I didn't get my nickname till college. Oh, okay. Uh, and ironically, it was Sponge. Sponge. And, and it wasn't. When I was younger, my hair was a little longer, and my hair is very naturally curly. Uh, I just tell my kids who will listen to this some some point. It was nothing to do with drinking. <laughs> <laughs> I swear it wasn't. I swear. <laughs> so how tall are you? Six three six four. All right, with the pro six five. There you go. Yeah, <laughs> a little uh, a reference to Chevy Chase and yeah, you have to be old enough to know Fletch. Fletch. Were, were you a tall kid too, or are you average? And then the growth spurt happened. <clears throat> so I was I was pretty average. And actually, when people say they went to college and gained fifteen pounds, I actually gained a freshman fifty. Oh, oh wow! Um, I ran a lot in, in uh, growing up, and and uh, track and cross country were a big thing. But it was. I graduated from high school at maybe six to 150 pounds. Jeez. Wow. And by the time, uh, after a couple of years of college, that had changed. Yeah. Um, so. 50 pounds of muscle. Well, yeah. You'd need or a beer weight. <laughs> yeah. Sponge weight. Sponge, Sponge weight. <laughs> <laughs> so what were, uh, we talked about this a little bit beforehand, but so what were uh, what were some of those go to albums or or groups that you really liked to listen to as you were in your formative years? You know, a, a lot of it was you know if, if it was mainstream uh, alternative, but you know REM was a big one. Yeah, a lot of the the early albums in particular. You know, U two. I, I was always in the music scene, and and by the time I transferred, went to Vermilion. Uh, my favorite bar down there was Leo's because they always brought in live music. And then back in those early 90s of those pomp room days or Phil's Pub and, and uh, some of the bands that you could, just, you could see every Saturday, every Friday and Saturday. And so live music was always really important. You know, a local band that my buddies and I always followed and my wife did as well and her, were the Gear Daddies. We're out of the cities. And uh, in fact, the Gear Daddies played in Vermilion one time and... Uh, Talked to the band into coming to our house after the show and partied and then headed downtown. Oh, and, very uh, cool. Yeah, it was just music that tells stories. Yeah. Is important. So uh, I was just going to ask you if the, what was uh, like some people are, they just really like the music. Some people like the lyrics or they fall in love with the lead singer. But that music that tells stories. I like that. Music that tells stories. It's, it's why, as you know, some of that progressed, you know, I'm a huge Springsteen guy. I think Bruce does a fantastic job of, of telling a story through music. And um, I particularly love, as we talk about country, and uh, Tracy Chapman was, I mean, I had that album in 89, yeah. 88, and, and uh, 
fast car and and everyone going crazy over Luke Combs and he did a fabulous cover and, and to give the guy credit he did a great job of of giving her the spotlight and uh it was artists like that or you know 10,000 maniacs back then that oh yeah I'd see and, and it was just good stories so would Bruce be your country music fan or your country music option if you went country <laughs> what would that sound like raspy <laughs> <laughs> really raspy what was he say? What did you say? To pick up in a beer. <laughs> so, pick up in a beer. <laughs> and would you play a saxophone while you're singing country music? Exactly. That could be a new genre of music. I mean, if, if Beyonce can go country, anybody can go country. That's true. Well, I haven't heard that album yet. Have you? It's only two songs right now, I think. <laughs> it's only two. I, I can put on a cowboy hat and say I'm country too. But Oh, yeah. I, I, would, I would not disagree with you if you said that or did that. I could totally. You could pull that off. So as you are growing up and you got your Hilltop Gang, which isn't that an actual musical group, the Hilltop Gang? I, I think it might be his alter ego. <laughs> <laughs> well, not all of them, just one of them. Just one of them. <laughs> so, so how big was your family? So I have four siblings and, so, and my parents, and uh, I was the youngest, my oh. twin and I, uh, two older sisters and an older brother who was 10 years older, so five of us which well, always true. meant you know we we had the griswold family station wagon <laughs> we did not have the third row seat you just you maybe got lucky enough to lay down back there yeah um but yeah lots of family time family was very important i don't did did we talk uh i don't know if i remember that you said that you were a twin before i don't i don't, I don't think know. so i have a twin sister oh you do obviously not identical thank god for her yeah yeah <laughs> what so was your twin uh identical or not we are not not at all not at all yeah he's a couple inches shorter we do a lot we do a lot of the same things but even in high school we had separate groups of friends yeah you know it was but it always meant wherever you went you knew something or someone and uh so we played well off each other with that gotcha do you guys have similar thoughts we do uh i can't tell you what he's thinking yeah Although I probably know just from knowing him well enough, um, yeah, we we're, we're a little bit different in some of our views on life, uh, but it all all in a good balance. Yeah. So, which high school did you go to? Lincoln. Lincoln, of course. Yeah. And we have Lincoln. I have two kids. One daughter went to Washington. One went to Lincoln. Both found great groups of friends at, at both. So you have a favorite one? Favorite child? You mean? One claims that I have a favorite one. <laughs> <laughs> For Christmas this year, actually, I had to wear with all my siblings being, and, and we host because, uh, and my mom was there. Um, I went, Wahlburgers has a shirt, mom's favorite. I made sure to wear that to Christmas this year. <laughs> <laughs> my siblings weren't as amused as my family was. That was my direct. So, what did your parents do as you, when you were growing up? So, my dad was an elementary school principal here in Sioux Falls. My mom was a first grade teacher. Wow. Um, so, it was. Education's always been very important to the family, and actually my oldest daughter, who's named after my father, uh, teaches herself. She's in her second year of teaching in Harrisburg, and uh, so very proud of that tradition. And really, you know, kind of a neat connecting story, Longfellow, where my office is now, is one elementary where my mom taught first grade. Wow. So wow. It was fun to take her back when we had done some of the renovations, and for her to be able to walk through and see it, it was very powerful. So. That's very cool. Yeah. All right. Did your dad spank kids? He did not. Uh, one time, I remember one time being spanked growing up. And uh, again, being a twin, we were a little, uh, we roughhouse a lot. Yep. You know, fighting was, it, it just happened every day. Happens, you just yeah. wrestled with your brother. And uh, I think we were probably finishing junior high. And I jumped on his back and he threw me through a, the wall <laughs> oh <laughs> to which we knew we were in big trouble and, yeah. but no it, spanking just didn't have but you also respect was built in yeah and uh respect I, i'm a firm believer that respect is earned yeah mm -hmm. and uh it was demonstrated by our parents and and then it was something we we followed so like if kids got sent to the principal's office would he dole out the punishment as well I just think there's an intimidation factor. I mean, again, being a, a guy who's six three, six four, uh, 
and, and plenty of weight to go behind that. Um, <laughs> People are just intimidated by that, you know, and it's just a natural thing. And it's just the fear of, I think when the three of us were growing up, the fear of saying you need to go to the principal's office is probably different than it is today. Yeah. Yeah. God, if you had to go home and tell your parents you were sent to the principal's office. Oh, you had to tell them? They would just call up your parents. Oh. There was no hiding that. Here's what, here's what my mom did in elementary school. And uh, Mr. Lincoln, our, our principal, he went to the church, same church as my folks. <laughs> so every day... Uh, every day, every every uh, my kindergarten through sixth grade, my mom would say, uh, you know, Mr. Lincoln, as usual, if uh, if Jeff or Ronda gets sent to the principal's office, you give them as much of a punishment as they deserve, and then you call me because they're going to get some more of that when they get home. <laughs> and Mr. Lincoln had a wooden paddle, pretty good size, and for whatever reason, he put three very wide rubber bands on that. I guess that was supposed to hurt more. And yeah, if you went... If you got sent to the principal's office, you'd get two pretty good whacks on the back end. You know, I I run into a lot of people just in different um, circles in, in Sioux Falls. And, and I still have people of a certain age who say, you know, I had your dad as a principal. And even in this last year, someone stopped me and said, I had him. And uh, he said, the thing that impressed me about your dad, and it's something I try and do, is they said he knew every kid's name. Mm. And he greeted him, and he said, even though he did that, every kid felt special because they were acknowledged yeah. and they were recognized for being who they were. And, and that's something that's very important to me and how I try and, and work every day is, um, you know, when there's a new staff orientation, getting there, or getting to house meetings, and the message of I'm listening, people can tell pretty quick whether it's true or not. And mm -hmm. uh, um, But that's... Uh, that was something that's important to me. And it's something that I'm proud of that I hear about my parents or was out to eat not long ago with my mom. And someone came over and said, I had you in class. And she said their name. And that was probably 50 years ago. Wow. wow. Their ability to connect names, I am horrible at it. Yeah. So <laughs> you, I'm probably going to give my secret away. And my wife is brilliant because if I don't introduce you in the first 30 seconds, she'll reach out her hand and say, hi, I'm Angie. What's your name? And And I can... <laughs> yeah. Almost always place the person where I know I'm from, yeah. but um, it's just, it, it, that's not a strength. Yeah, so. yep. same. So being in a family that's so educational focused, um, did that affect what you wanted to be when you were younger? Yeah, you know, I think it did. And um, when I was in school and then in college, um, as I finished college down at the University of South Dakota, I started working for Lutheran Social Services uh, Counseling kids and in beers for South Dakota actually and before going into that it was it just was unnatural for me not everyone goes everyone should go to college and then when as I worked and understood and and, and got to know people who that that wasn't going to be their reality and and it was good that it wasn't their reality but helping them find what it could be um, was important and how you define success or how I define success. You know, I look at even people in their, or getting into their 20s and, and, and thinking they have the roadmap figured out. And I just want to encourage people, you, you don't know what that roadmap is. And there were some events that happened in my life that made me question where, where the future was going to be. But um, I also understand there's, there's a reason those things happen and how you react to them is ultimately how you get to where you need to be. And, and the, the, that adage of a door closes and a window opens, I'm a firm believer in that. And, and so that's, yeah, did I know where I was going? I, college wasn't, it wasn't an option that we weren't gonna go. Yeah. But I, I, I think there was also a time where the education wise and society wise, we didn't do a lot of people favors. You know, Even when I was still in high school at Lincoln, there was a shop, and it was important for the people who mm -hmm. looked to that. And then when that disappeared and went away, I mean, I think we're seeing a whole generation or a gap in, in service industry that is so essential to our continued growth that just wasn't encouraged. And, and to see the worth of someone working a hard day but an honest day yeah. is something that's so much more important than just having a degree. Exactly. Yeah. We'll be right back. 
So you mentioned you had a a pretty unique experience around the time that you were 17 or on your 17th birthday with your brother. Yeah, so I my older brother who was 10 years older was uh in he had one month to go uh before he graduated med school down at the University of South Dakota and uh was killed in a car accident. Uh. Mm. And so my 17th birthday was his funeral. And so Vince, as you talk about you know, what is, it certainly changed what I thought was the future and, and kind of that idea of why not get the nickname Sponge? Because um, you never know what tomorrow's going to bring. So live for today type mentality. And, yeah. um, you know, it took soul searching. It, it took uh, hmm. being able to process. I, I grew up in a family that every Sunday, it wasn't a question whether you're going to church or not, you're going to church. And so watching how different people deal with a tragedy like that is interesting. Um, and each person needs to find their path through that, I believe. And whether, again, music was a huge part of my life and listening to a variety of music. And uh, I was fortunate to have, it was a four, four CD set from Eric Clapton that included his full genre. But in that is um, from a small time he was with me. It was a, called, a song called I've, The Presence of the Lord. And Growing up in a pretty religious family, it was the ability to question why mm -hmm. for the first time is what that song kind of brought to me. And it was, it isn't someone's preconceived notion or doctrine on what life is, but finding that contact or relationship on your own with whatever you believe right. um, was important. And it, it taught me a couple of really important lessons of you know, I hear people, and I still hope people hear people say, why me? And what it taught me to do is say, why not me? Yeah. And so when bad things happen, to look at it from a perspective of why not me, get yourself out of the victim role. Mm. Why not me also applies, though, to good things. Mm -hmm. Why not? Why don't good things happen to me? And, and when they do, acknowledging them and, and appreciating them for what they are. So... It isn't always just bad. It's it's also the good things in life that we have. Uh, wow, we went way down. No, that's so, good. I no. love it. I love it because uh, I think it's an important life lesson, and I, we appreciate you sharing that, and being Thank vulnerable you. with that. It's a it's a it's a tragedy to be just one month away from med school and have that happen to him. But we had, um, I think, if it's in the same book, Vince and I uh, have either read or in the process of reading this book by uh, Ryan Holiday called mm -hmm. "The Obstacle Is the Way." And it's it's very much stoic based, and he talks a lot about stoicism. But I think it's in this book where he talks about some people have this attitude that life happens to them, things happen to them. Mm -hmm. And he said, but, you know, sometimes you have to look at things don't happen to you, things happen with you. And, and that if you can maybe let some of that stuff not necessarily deflect off, but if you if you let it kind of come into you, wash through you, and then and then move on, it's not that things happen to you and that victim mentality, like you said, it's more the recognizing stuff's going to happen and learn from it and then move forward, and then that's going to help you to help other people overcome some of the challenges. I think that's right on. And, and as, as you're talking about that, it, the victim mentality is exactly what came to my head was how you're going to live your life as the victim or someone who overcomes. And yeah. So. Wow, that's pretty deep. So, when you went to uh, USD, then what was your what was your degree in? So that was another thing. You know, you're going through a transition of mm -hmm. trying to figure out life, and you know, I, I think I probably had five or six majors. Because um, <laughs> you also started somewhere else too, didn't you? Yeah, I started. As, I started. It was in a small school uh, that was actually church related. It was called Kelvin now University. It's in Grand Rapids, Michigan, mm -hmm. and. Uh, you know, part of it, what, what I'd gone through at 17, I, I wanted to get away from Sioux Falls. And I think oh, it, yeah. it was that mentality of a lot of people in those late 80s, early 90s of saying, you know, I want to get away and experience some things. And it was 800 miles away from Sioux Falls. And it was a place where my parents were fine with me going to because of the relationship and spent a couple of years there. And then it got really expensive to not really have a major. <laughs> and uh, so I transferred to USD and was fortunate to live with a couple of buddies from high school that uh, just that support was there for each other. Yeah. And uh, and I had a couple of different majors down there, um, but ended up with a, a psychology degree. It was funny. My my youngest daughter, who is a senior at USD this year, 
Did you yeah. say spongeology? Spon spongeology. Carbonation? Psychology. Yeah. I have a master's <laughs> degree in spongeology. <laughs> <laughs> she said to my wife at one time, I might get a psych degree. And she laughed. She said, why? Do you want to own a, a small a clothing store in Sioux Falls or work with adults with disabilities? And, <laughs> and our daughter said, well, what are you talking about? And she goes, well, your dad and I both have degrees in psychology. <laughs> Not bashing anyone with a degree in psychology. Yeah. I, it has helped me, helped me so much, especially when I was in development, to be able to just understand and read people and yeah. uh, see where they're coming from, meeting them there. So, uh, yeah, there's a few majors. I have a... If, if USD had had a hyd hydrology degree when I was there, because I was an earth science major for a long time, uh, I have a history. I have lots of minors. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not so, sure any of my professors knew me, but I have lots of minors. <laughs> what's a... Uh, it's a joke there. <laughs> what, what's a listener tip from um, psychology that you wish that more people knew and used? People talk too much. If they would sit and listen and truly process what the other person is saying, um, you can figure out a lot about a person. And uh, it, it just, I, I think it shows the most respect to that person. It's one thing I talk about working where I do. I walk down the hall and, and the people we support especially will say, hey, how, what'd you do last night? They actually want to know. Mm -hmm. It isn't just how too often we go by each other and go, hey, how's your day? And, and you're, you're not even focused on what the person even answers as you walk by. And that's one true blessing I have every day when I go to work is people take the time. And, and so that one thing I'd say, stop talking and listen. Fair listening. I like that. So did you have any particular class or project or a moment during your collegiate career, I'm just going to give say career because I don't know how many years it was. Yeah, some people could be doctors <laughs> when they're there as long as I was. That, that case kind of has a left kind of an impact or, or kind of shifted directions for you? You know, I, I think it, it, it's funny because my mother will actually say when I was in high school, I took a class that should, every person should have to take in life, and they don't. I don't believe they have it anymore, but it was called single survival. And in that class, really? you learn to prepare a meal, darn a sock, budget, actually write in your checkbook ledger, which I don't admit I do either <laughs> still. But, um, but at that time, I was paired with a student who had some needs. And, and my mom points to those days to say, we knew early on that that was the route or that was a, a special place for you. So, you know, I, I think that I think part of it, the lesson that I was given growing up, um, both my parents were extremely involved in volunteering throughout the community in a number of different areas. And uh, so that was the lesson that we were taught of you get back and you don't, you get involved. Again, I, I shared with you guys that I'm, and no one listening to this will believe this because I haven't stopped talking, but I'm an introvert. <laughs> and uh, for me to get out, out of a comfort zone and do this is, is hard, but you need a seat at the table if you want to help change anything yeah. and so sometimes that means you have to get out of your comfort zone and and uh understand that you have a voice and again that listening and, and sharing is so important but uh yeah so what's darning a sock darning yeah what's that's darning when you is? that's when you're sewing it and you prick yourself you say darn it that's called darning you get a hole see back you used to get a hole in your sock and you'd actually sew it close so, so you can continue wearing it no one would ever do that anymore. They yeah, just like, throw the heard. sock away. Throw it in the trash. And <laughs> was, I going. love to date myself that way. <laughs> darn the sock. Darn the darn sock. sock. <laughs> so you told us like this. This is a surprise story. Um, I love that you told us this. So you had a run in with Steven Tyler of Aerosmith. You're his. Tell us that story. Yeah. So one of those roommates from Vermilion was the head of security at the arena, and so. Uh, and what year was this? It, this has got to be early 90s. Okay. Uh, it, it was actually the, the, the time that Aerosmith went and played at the Pomp Room. Um, but Kurt Loder, so this is back in MTV VJ days, yep. and Kurt Loder used to do rockumentaries. Jeff is nodding. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Just going, what the he always had the rock about? news. He always did the news on the yeah. rock stars. And uh, so they're doing a rockumentary. They're in Sioux Falls. And so I was technically his bodyguard, but uh, during the interview that they did for MTV, I got to sit in on it, and as the band entered the room, um, 
Steven Tyler walked over and he was all of 5'3". <laughs> and uh, just wonder, walked up and said, hi, my name's St Steven Tyler, what's your name? And I just, I said to him, that's really nice of you. <laughs> <laughs> but they, they were very pleasant and uh, it, it was quite an experience. Um, I worked a lot of different concerts with, with uh, at the arena then, but that was that was the one that was pretty incredible that you don't forget. So yeah, I bet I bet. So what took you from being a security guard to getting into Dakota Abilities? How did, how did that transition happen? So one, it was being a bodyguard or a, a security <laughs> guard was a simple way to get money to keep that Sponge Nick's name going. <laughs> um, <laughs> I had actually started working for Lutheran Soul Services, and, and my degree that I was pursuing actually was in um, middle school education and uh, was going down that path. And, and actually working there, I was able to, you know, I already had a minor at least in psych, and uh, working there, I could get enough credits to actually graduate. I'm like, well, I can be done, so um, I'm just going to be done with a psych degree. You know, obviously, I took the course and got the numbers, but... but it was that experience of hands-on, and, and it was interesting because as I'm working with, with the kids then, I'd go to class, and, and um, some of the advice that was given, I'm, I'm just shaking my head going, oh, you're going to get punched. There's no way that's going to work in the real world. Um, Such as? you got to share some of his advice now. <laughs> Cautionary tale. Yeah, I, it was just you know their advice on how you get in and talk to someone, and it's like, You've never been in a room with a kid who's acting up that their natural defense is to hit. And it wasn't that the, the kid was violent, but that's, that's what part of what their upbringing had been for some of them. And it, mm -hmm. it just, it was also a way for them to get a, attention. Mm -hmm. Part of that exposure, um, I then, by this time, I've worked there for a few years and met the woman I was going to marry. And uh, she was finishing school in Mankato. And uh, she thought when she, we were done, we should move to Minneapolis. And uh, I was in Sioux Falls at the time and, and driving to Beersford. And so I thought I need a part-time job or a, a job just to get through till we move. She's done with school. And so I went to what was then Sioux Vocational Services and uh, applied and, and was hired. And, you know, this is 32 years now working in this group in this area. And... Uh, I truly went from finding a place where, you know, as, as well as you worked with a person, some of the kids were just in a spot where they weren't as always appreciative of your advice. <laughs> and uh, I went to a group that, again, it was the questions of, what'd you do last night? What'd you have for supper last night? What'd you, what'd you watch on TV? And it was just such a different and welcoming group that I fell into. Honestly, it was the biggest blessing in my life to to find that other than wife and kids, but yeah. it was, uh, hmm. it, it's truly who I am. And uh, I've had the ability in working in the field then to work direct care and manage house and, and been what a, a, a service coordinator, which was like a social worker role uh, to HR to development to every position pretty much in, in, the, in the field. And, you know, when you walk those journeys with the individual in one role or you're walking with the family as they're making those transitions or finding the right support and and to finding funding for that, to, mm -hmm. for those th dreams to really happen, it, it's just been a, a true blessing. So for people who um, are listening to this and may not be in Sioux Falls or not familiar, tell us what, what is Dakota Abilities and, and what, do you, what do you do there? So Dakota Billies is a community support provider, what we're technically known by as the state. And what we do is we provide support to adults with intellectual disabilities. Uh, in the state of South Dakota, that all those services can be provided by one organization. Some states like Minnesota, for example, they have a separate day and service or uh, and residential. Um, in South Dakota, those both can occur under one umbrella. And so Dakota Billies itself, uh, there are 20 community support providers in the state of South Dakota. Our niche is the health um, level of health care that we're available, we can provide. <laughs> um, speech is a big part of what we do, obviously. Um, but so we're the only ones with a house that serves adults that have a nurse 24-7. Dakota Billies owns 13 houses around Sioux Falls. Um, 
where individuals are supported with the needs they ha have, uh, and then also at a couple different apartment complexes. And then primarily our day services, eight years ago we bought the old Longfellow Elementary School from the school district and refabbed that, and uh, that's where our day services, really meaningful day. There would have been a time when all these organizations uh, will be 60 years old next year, and wow. um, it was vocational training, so it was after kids, if they were able to get any education, someone to help them find a job. And it was really back in 65, 60 years ago where families said, I'm not going to listen to what society says and what my doctors tell me that I'm going to send my child away and forget about him. You know, um, Redfield, South Dakota was where the state institution was. And at one time, 1,200 people were served out hmm. there. And it's, wow. it's down into the 75, 80s now. But because parents had really the, the love of their child to say, not mine. And, um, but it was really bucking society. Yeah. And, and because back then, a lot of the misconceptions, especially by certain circles, was that a family must have done something wrong for the child to have a disability. Sure. And you know, we, we know today that's just simply not true. And um, what we do is we try and connect people in different ways to their community and, and have them have healthy, um, interactions and, and opportunities so that day services that happens at Longfellow uh, you know a lot of our individuals are nonverbal but that doesn't mean they don't have something to say and so mm -hmm. we we've, we've geared things towards things that allow people to express themselves and we've done it by partnering so things like partnering with Black Hills Playhouse we've done 17 18 plays now where it allows people to get and, and if they're nonverbal finding technology that helps them to have a voice mm -hmm. um, in that Art and music are huge. Uh, we've been blessed this week. Um, we had uh, South Dakota Symphony is a great partner. They come out multiple times a year and play on the stage we have. Uh, we had both the strings and the winds at different times this week on our stage for mm -hmm. people to listen to. But lots of different folks with music from Dixieland bands to a, a Holly comes and plays piano. Um, it, it, it just a variety of things, but. Uh, and then it's getting out in the community. So we, what are ways we can give back? Uh, March is actually Disability Awareness Month. Oh. And um, so we just had an article come out in Pigeon 605, uh, thanks to Jody Schwan and that partnership there. But uh, it talked about some ways people are involved. And there's one story there about Shirley, who volunteers at her church. And we asked one of the deacons to just write something about Shirley, and it comes back about a two-page document <laughs> about how she impacts that entire congregation and, and what a joy that is. And, and um, it's, she's really found a voice through that. We also have groups that volunteer down at the Levitt. There's uh, several different areas. Another thing that was pop, really positive, and it's, it's fun to see how some swimming pools are going to change in Sioux Falls. Again, being that hilltop kid, I grew up riding my bike to Frank Olson. Well, Frank Olson's going to be reborn. And um, it, it was nice to talk to the Parks Department and, and Don Kearney over there about, you know, what are some things, some benefits we have. We have groups that go swimming every, about every other day, uh, three times a week for sure, uh, at the Midco Aquatic Center. And having that indoor swimming uh, facility where um, weather is no longer uh, an issue, whether you can do it. Um, certainly winter wasn't a good time to be out at Frank Olson yeah. unless you're skateboarding. <laughs> uh, so... Yeah, just some good things that people get involved in. We'll be right back. So Vince and I uh, were fortunate enough uh, last year, pretty close this time, where uh, we actually did a video project with Dakota Abilities, and it was it was really uh, affirming, eye opening but assuring of the kind of work that you and the staff do there. Mm -hmm. And it's so easy, especially for someone like me, to get kind of emotional. Because you've got individuals that have one or more really complex issues. And for parents who are used to taking care of their children and they know that they may not be able to have the ability to help their own kids or uh, for some of the individuals we talked with, their, their kids um, are going to outlast them. And so what does a parent do? When, uh, when that's the case, they've got to find someplace safe where they know their kids are going to be taken care of. And you've got a specific board member in my head that spoke to us about that. 
And uh, it just says a lot about an organization when, when a parent uh, or parents are saying, hey, this, I know my child is safe uh, at a place like Dakota Abilities. Yeah, we don't take that lightly. The trust that people put in us, because I'm not going to tell a parent that I can do it better than they did. But walking that journey together um, is so important. You know, people really come to our services in a couple different ways. One, people are transitioning out of special education mm -hmm. services. So they're turning 21, 22, and they're transitioning. And that's a, that's a difficult journey for that individual and the family because school's different than even when we would have been in school in Sioux Falls and, and, and how the education systems come a long ways on inclusion. And you would see people, in the conversation I'd often have with parents, especially when I was a service coordinator, was um, what does our society mark a success? And we talked a little bit about that. What's the, what was the expectation? You're gonna to go to school and you're gonna do this or you're gonna get a job. And, and what a lot of our folks would see is their, their friends that they had made in school went off and were doing those things mm -hmm. and they were still at home. And what they had heard a success, they maybe weren't doing. And so finding a way for that to happen with the right support is important. And then we also see folks who they've probably stayed home with mom and dad and mom and dad are now maybe going, needing the assistance. And, and uh, that's usually much more of an emergency situation, mm -hmm. which mm -hmm. is the worst thing to do uh, in that it's an emergency. And so it is today. Mom fell, she's going to assisted living somewhere and now Nathan has nowhere to go. Yeah. And so that pre-planning and understanding. So we have families who will walk that journey and, and maybe they start in that day services program and still live at home. And, and that's important. We talked a little bit about Redfield and the institution and there are families, and this is the hardest part to admit as someone who's been doing this 32 years, there are people who may see us as the institution now. Mm. And so wanting to understand that each individual needs to walk that journey and come up with a plan and what's successful for them is at our core. Mm -hmm. And um, while there are pieces that are set up to, for us to be able to do that, we certainly want to work, walk that journey together. So that, that's a hard thing to admit when you, you've really spent your life doing it. But uh, it's also something we have to recognize that not everyone's going to want that same model. So where do, where do you see uh, Dakota Abilities in the next five, 10 years? What can, what can people in the community do to support Dakota Abilities? You know, I, I think the community just continues to evolve and their acceptance and opportunities. It takes time for a society to evolve and it takes brave people introducing concepts that may be scary to others. And for that to become a norm and acceptance, I think when people get to the point where they have the opportunity for exposure of, of what those possibilities mm -hmm. are, they're much more open to it, but can be guarded. Sioux Falls is evolving, and there are lots of opportunities uh, for folks to be involved. We actually just completed a strategic plan in January, and part of that is a 10% growth, which is really difficult in... Uh, you know, we're heavily based in our direct support professionals, and we've got some fantastic staff. But we, we employ almost 250 people. So the ability to add more is difficult when the workforce is an issue. We are actually, and I, I would knock on wood, but you said it would mess up my microphone. <laughs> I could do it on my head, too. But uh, we're in the best spot we've been in staff-wise in a decade, wow. really. Um, and a lot of that is due to a lot of hard work from some from some directors uh, of the association, but also our legislators in peer and their recognition of what services are necessary and how uh, funding needs to be appropriate for that. Mm -hmm. And so that's allowed us to get to a point where our wages can be at a point again where people can make that as a choice. You know, I certainly made that a choice 30 years ago with a college degree. Um, but even as a, three years ago when my oldest daughter was graduating from USD and, and one of her friends didn't have a job and I said, hey, tell them we're hiring. And she, she snickered a little and said, dad, he's got a college degree. And I said, yeah, so did I when I started working there. <laughs> um, Except you signed a contract in blood. 
<laughs> <I did. laughs> Work hire, release. Hire me or the Hilltop Gang's gonna come after you at any time. <laughs> no, it was really it was really um fun to be there and work with uh, your team and the folks that you support. I remember the one gentleman with the the scooter who just was racing us down the sidewalk <laughs> and it was like every game was a game. It was great. The thing that uh that you told us uh when we had worked with you on that project a year ago was there are there are people who sometimes are averse to talking to people who aren't exactly like them people that might have intellectual disabilities and they had said well uh what do i call them how do i address them and you said call them by their name and i just thought that was so powerful and we've seen um i remember andrea who uh uh is she still there i assume absolutely so she comes to see me every day um mm -hmm. so andrea's in a wheelchair i don't know what her diagnosis is it's not that important but but she's uh, full of joy, mm -hmm. uh, not too verbal. I mean, well, she's she's verbal in her way, but she yep. can't speak too well. But you you just simply say that first name, and she'll smile, and then she'll she'll talk to you the best way that she can. And she's a she's just an example of so many over there. And I think I can't remember his name. What's Diddy's son's name? Michael. Oh, Michael. Michael. Yeah. So Michael is probably in his fifties, I would guess. Um, and I remember talking to them, and his dad had said, if you want to get Michael to smile, ask him about his rock and roll collection or whatever. And he's just this big Kiss fan. And so every time that we ran into Michael, I would say something about Kiss, and his eyes would light up. So it's <laughs> yeah. a really, really cool population of people there at Dakota Billy's for sure. And I think I think exactly what you're talking about, it, 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 go look up Pigeon 605 and look at that article from, that Jody just did this week. and. Shirley's impact on that church. We've seen that in a number of places. Citibank in Sioux Falls, from when it opened, had a group that worked out there. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. to this day, they still talk about to their core how important that is to them and their, all their employees. And again, it, the simple message, we all want to be recognized. Whether yeah. we verbalize that or not, mm -hmm. having someone acknowledge that we're there is important for all of us, and it, it doesn't matter if you have a disability or not. If you're if you're feeling down or, or uh, troubled, God, that sounds like a country song. Too. <laughs> there you go. You may have a future. We may yeah. be right. In this <laughs> Don't tell his wife. <laughs> but I think everyone wants to have just be acknowledged for who they are. Yep. So I don't remember his name. Uh, I can see where his glasses. He's kind of tall. Not a lot of hair in his head. Pretty young guy, um, but he works at the High V off of uh, 26th Street uh -huh. and he lives in a group home and it was fun because as the I kind of tracked him I uh, I wanted to get him in his environment so uh, we did a little video of him at the group home and then we went to Ivy and to watch him from afar as he was walking to work it was like he was the proudest guy of all time mm -hmm. and and it wasn't because I was filming him I was but he was just just full of joy and just happy that he had a job and he had friends mm -hmm. and uh you know he is independent of his mom and uh it's just it's really cool to see uh individuals who are overcoming so many challenges and making the best of what they can do you know and that's a conversation too there with families where we all do this as parents you compare your kids in one way or another and and what one person says it thinks is success and one one plus it's different for all of us right and so i've, I've had parents who worry about that and I'll, I'll say is your son happy where he lives well yeah does he like his friends yeah he's got great mm -hmm. friends they do so much they're always active they're doing this does he like where he goes during the day yep that his job yep loves it always talks about his co-work blah 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 what more would you want yeah mm -hmm. yeah and uh I think it makes people stop and go, oh, yeah, that, that would be success mm -hmm. and happiness. And so. It's very cool. All right. This Please. is where Vince asked the. Uh, oh, the, the tell all. The tell all question. <laughs> so, Nathan, the theme of our show has always been taking those kernels of knowledge or those uh, looking back. You know, we look, we look back and we have fun talking about the silly hijinks we get in as we grew up. And then we, we kind of mature a bit. But we, we really want to see, for our viewers, how can we thread 
that connection between the past and the present. So is there a specific, um, whether it's a story, a quote, um, a situation, or something that you can paint for our viewers of something that was very important or formative to you early on that you still carry with you today in what you do, whether it's personally or professionally? You know, I, I think professionally it's, um, so if you're in my office, there, there's, a, there's a little piece of paper hanging on the, the door, and it, it, it's a quote by uh, someone we all grew up with, but the quote's pretty simple, and, and it's, uh, it starts with, it's nice to be important, but it's important to be nice. It's by Kermit the Frog. Oh, I was going to say Mr. Rogers. <laughs> and, and, and it's on, it, it's on my, as a reminder, uh, behind my desk, if you're in my office, you'll see it. And, and it, it goes back to just those basic things of seeing people as people, mm -hmm. um, giving them the respect, respect to acknowledge them as a person. You know, it's one of the biggest things that I've tried to in, instill in my kids is we'd be walking through a restaurant or somewhere and they'd walk by a, another kid who I know they know. And as a society, sometimes people just, they just keep going. They don't say anything, even just a simple hello. Yeah. And so um, what I try and still, it, just the simple gesture of a hello is enough to make someone know that they're seen and um, brings them value. And then... What that builds on is the ability when you go back, and, and it's important, our, our entire leadership team sees the, the importance of getting input from all. But if they know you acknowledge them as being important, they're more willing to share their mm -hmm. feelings and thoughts. Sometimes it's hard to get people to understand just because you've shared your feelings and thoughts and I do something different doesn't devalue what you said. But... Uh, still the fact that they had the courage to do that. And, and the more you can encourage that, the more they'll do it. And uh, so that, that's, that's a rambling version of... of uh, <laughs> it's a good one. I think something that I think it's important to take with you in life. And, and it's simple steps. Stop talking and listen a little more. Yeah. Um, acknowledge people. Pretty basic stuff. But it's good stuff. Very good. Well, we could all we could all use a little more Kermit the Frog in our lives, right? Probably so. <laughs> Probably so. Uh, well, with that, uh, viewers, to find out more about Nathan and his work at Dakota Abilities, you'll find uh, all the links and etc. on our show notes. And we thank you again for your time, and thank you, Nathan, for being here with us. Thank you both. Appreciate it. Thank and you. we'll see you all next time on Nostalgia Street. Make sure to subscribe to our podcast on your favorite podcast platform. If you're on iTunes, please take a moment and leave us a rating and review. Head on over to our YouTube channel and hit that subscribe button. You'll get access to engaging visuals that complement our podcast content. Thanks again for tuning in, and we look forward to having you with us on our next episode. So until next time, listeners, stay curious, stay engaged, and never stop walking down Nostalgia Street. <laughs>